Hi, and welcome back to the committee program. I'm your host, Arun Chaudhary, and now we are continuing our important work with Holly Brett, our continental papal and royal correspondent, and we will continue our journey with keeping up with the Habsburgs. Uh, I am embarrassed to say that I fell asleep last night uh, during our pre, or a few nights ago during our previous engagement on this. So I am gonna actually make coffee. I hope you're not disturbed while we're doing this. And I'm also testing out the new experimental kitchen studio apparatus for uh, our upcoming cooking sequences. But Holly, thank you so much for coming back. Really appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Um, before we even launch into it, uh, because I know we're trying to catch up to the present so we can learn more about race car driver Habsburg and his chances maybe at, at Austrian politicianship. Um, where I remember it was the family took its name from a castle in Swabia and then through kind of luck of the draw and not being kind of offensive to anyone managed to get elected uh, in the Holy Roman Empire and then conquered a little bit I wasn't exactly sure in between Rulof I and Otto II, they kind of conquered out east towards Austria a bit to kind of make the ancestral lands that we consider the ancestral lands. And I think that's where we left off. Is that about right? Can you start us off someplace? That's as, as much as I can remember. Yeah, that's about right. We're starting with the collapse, of course, of the Hohenstaufen line and the election of Rudolf I as, as the king of the Romans. And we were just getting into how he started to come to power and really uh, cons consolidate his, his power. So I can continue, yeah. And I yeah, please, know that, take it right from there. Yeah, and I'll try to keep it brief because I know that, of course, our viewers are really anxious to catch up to the present. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so when Rudolph was elected, this did come as a surprise to him uh, because he really was the least bad option and he wasn't particularly powerful at the time especially compared to the king of Bohemia at the time, Ottokar II. And King Ottokar had much more power, much more land, a stronger army, but he seemed to want the job way too much. And other prince electors didn't want to see him come to power. So that's right. They landed on uh, Rudolf I. So his rise to power there was really luck of the draw. Uh, the other prince electors, they also really wanted Rudolph I to establish authority over the king of Bohemia and to take action against him. So coming into this, the pressure was on for Rudolph I to really establish himself and his authority. So the first thing that he did was initially to take a diplomatic approach. Rudolph demanded that King Ottokar return lands that were annexed to him during the Great Interregnum. Ottokar, of course, wasn't having any of this. He totally rejected uh, this stipulation because acquiescing to this request really would have been seen as submission to the authority of Rudolf I. Since this didn't work, Rudolf upped the ante once again. He started making allies with Ottokar's enemies. So he ended up having allies including the Bavarian Witzelbox, the King of Hungary, and the Count Meinhard of Gorzia Tyrol. He also released the vassals of King Ottokar, so the vassals could quit their jobs or openly revolt, and they wouldn't be held to account for that. They were totally free to do that. So Rudolph I initially just started kind of fucking with the shit of Ottokar II and making friends with his enemies. This, of course, didn't totally get Ottokar to back down. And so in 1276, Rudolf escalated to military action against King Ottokar. He invaded Austria while his allies simultaneously went into Styria, which is also where Ottokar had land. Simultaneously, King Ottokar was facing a revolt of his own nobility. And so he was really at this weakened point facing all three fronts when Rudolf I was able to defeat him militarily. Still, though, Ottokar, after this defeat, even though it was a big win for Rudolf I, he did not concede. 
he had allies among the other princes also who didn't want to see the Habsburgs come to power because remember, it was a split vote really when Rudolf was elected. Many in the Austrian elite were not thrilled either to see Rudolf taking over Vienna and some of Rudolf's own supporters even abandoned him. So in 1278, there was another military conflict where Rudolf and his remaining allies confronted King Ottokar in Marchfield, which is a broad plain east of Vienna between the villages of Dummkrott and Jägenspiegen. Ottokar was murdered on the field by personal enemies, and so even though Rudolf I really only squeaked out a slight military victory in this battle, it was a clear win because of Ottokar's death. So that is how the Habsburgs initially made their move from Swabia in Switzerland and really just being only part of the Swabian aristocracy to coming to Vienna. And that's where we think traditionally of, you know, the home of the Habsburgs. Of course, we also call it the House of Austria. And that's really where they began to build their dynasty. After this victory, Rudolf installed some of his sons as rulers of Austria and Styria. By a process called an ethment, where feudal lands are deeded to others in service of, of those others, uh, two more territories were added to his empire, but those he gave to two of his closest allies. Those lands did not get reverted back into the to the Habsburgs until 1335, when those lines went extinct. And so, you know, at this time, Rudolf I, while he was nascent into his rise to power, he wasn't totally powerful. He was still very new, still very limited, despite these initial victories. So he really wanted to concentrate on consolidating his power base. So one of the things that he did was to try to reconcile with Bohemia, and he had his daughter marry Ottokar's son, and then one of Ottokar's daughters married one of Rudolf's sons. And so he tried as much as possible to make peace and alliances with other nobility at the time. And he also tried to follow Hohenstaufen traditions in order to provide some continuity between his leadership and past leadership. However, in a really you know, important break from Hohenstaufen tradition, he did seek the approval of the Pope. He really wanted to be crowned emperor by the Pope, and he sought this coronation for years, years and years, uh, but he was never able, actually, to get it. So, um, looks like Aaron might have fallen asleep again. Um, I know that uh, we're anxious to get through all of this history, but I think that maybe we should come back to this another time and we'll get you all caught up.